Hey, y'all. Late one night in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, a couple experienced what they deem an alien abduction. Months of hypnotherapy helped memories be regained, but was the experience an actual abduction? Or was it the result of exhaustion and overly active imaginations? Let's explore together. I'm Candace, and I'll be your guide. On September 19, 1961, Betty and Barney Hill were on their way home late one night, driving through the White Mountains of New Hampshire. They'd gone from their home in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, up to Montreal and Niagara Falls on a belated honeymoon trip. Barney and Betty were both really busy people, so this vacation was a much-needed reprieve from the hustle and bustle of daily life for them. Barney worked for the U.S. Postal Service as a mail carrier, working a grueling overnight shift where he drove 60 miles over the course of each night. Betty was employed as a social worker and responsible for child welfare cases for the state. Aside from their busy careers, they both also were social activists and busy with the NAACP, their Unitarian faith, and various volunteer activities. So as you can see, they were definitely eager to get away for a few days. In fact, they were so excited to escape for a while, they didn't even go to the bank ahead of time, so they just took off with the less than $70 they had in their pockets, eager for adventure. On the last night of their trip, the tired couple decided they could push through to make it home that night. They wanted to get ahead of the winds and rain of an impending hurricane. So they refueled themselves with some much-needed coffee at a diner in Vermont before heading out around 10 p.m., they figured if they made good time, they could be back home at Portsmouth around 2 or 3 in the morning at the latest. So they headed out, and at around 10.30 p.m. are driving through the White Mountains, just south of Lancaster, New Hampshire. They're driving along when Betty spots what she believes to be a star. She watches it dart from its position below the moon in the night sky to the left and above the moon. Initially, she assumed, oh, it's a shooting star. But as it continues its erratic movement, she realizes that she's witnessing a potential UFO. Betty's sister had seen a UFO in the past, and she'd heard her stories, so it wasn't an outlandish idea for her. She urged Barney to pull over at a scenic picnic area just south of Twin Mountain so they could check out the strange light, as well as walk their dog, Delcy. As they returned to their 1957 Chevy Bel Air and resumed their drive, they noticed that the lights zigged and zagged with the winding mountain roads, appearing and reappearing ahead of them in what almost seemed to be a cat-and-mouse game. Barney, who was a very logical person, as well as a World War II vet and airplane enthusiast, deduced that the light couldn't be from a commercial aircraft and must have been from a satellite that had gone off course. The craft came close enough for them to see that it had multicolored lights and they were flashing. Betty grabs some binoculars they had in the car for a better look and realizes that the lights belong to a spacecraft that is similar in shape to a thick pancake, disc-shaped with windows. As the ship passed by Old Man of the Mountain, a jutting granite cliff profile that is 40 feet long, Betty realizes the spacecraft is at least one and a half times the length of the cliff face, and it appears to be rotating. Roughly one mile south of Indian Head, the UFO silently but rapidly descended from the sky towards the road, forcing Barney to stop the car abruptly in the middle of the highway. Barney believes it is hovering about 80 to 100 feet off the ground. He reaches under his seat to grab the pistol that he keeps there and puts it into his pocket before stepping out of the car for a better look with the binoculars. Barney sees 8 to 11 humanoid figures wearing glossy, black, military-style uniforms and black caps. As they stare back at him, he sees all but one of them take a step backward, toward a panel at the rear of the room. As Barney stares at the one humanoid figure still standing at the window, he feels as if the creature sends a message to him telepathically, telling him, Stay where you are and keep looking. 
Red lights on the sides of the craft extend into what he later describes as bat wings, and a long structure descended from the bottom of the craft as it slowly lowered closer to the roadway than it had been. As this happened, Barney, absolutely terrified, ran back to the car and told Betty in absolute panic, they're going to capture us. As he drove away as fast as he could, the spacecraft moved into position above their car and followed suit. Barney told his wife to watch them as he drove, so she rolled down the window and looked up. As she did, they both heard a bizarre series of buzzing, beeping sounds that seemed to bounce off the trunk of their car. They felt a tingling, vibrating sensation throughout their bodies and began feeling very altered, almost in a dreamlike state of consciousness. The next thing they know, they hear another series of buzzes and beeps, and they wake up. They're in their car, still driving, but they're 35 miles south of where they had been and only have a very spotty, vague recollection of events. They can somewhat recall making an abrupt, unplanned turn, encountering a roadblock of some sort and seeing a fiery orb in the road. They finally make it home around dawn. The drive that should have taken them four hours from the point of contact with the unidentified spacecraft somehow took seven hours. The Hills lost three hours of time they cannot explain. After their arrival home, they find themselves experiencing some odd occurrences. Betty feels compelled to keep their luggage right next to the back door rather than allowing it further inside the home in its usual place. Both were taking unusually long showers, feeling the need to decontaminate themselves. Barney felt the need to thoroughly and repeatedly examine his genitalia, although nothing seemed out of the ordinary. He also notes that his dress shoes he'd been wearing that night were really scuffed, and the leather strap on the binoculars had been inexplicably torn. The dress Betty had been wearing had been torn at the hem, the zipper, and its lining. It also had a strange pinkish powder on it. They both note that their watches are no longer working. Finally, they find shiny, concentric circles on the trunk of their car that had not been there previously. They try some experiments with a compass, noting that when they move the compass near the circles, the needle spins rapidly, and when they move it away, it goes back to normal. The following day, Betty called nearby Pease Air Force Base to report the encounter. In effort to protect her credibility, she left out a lot of information about the encounter and merely reported that they saw an unusual spacecraft. The day after, September 22nd, Major Paul Henderson phoned Betty to get a more thorough interview. On the report, he noted that they may have seen the planet Jupiter in the sky and mistaken it for a spacecraft and phrases like insufficient data and optical conditions were scattered throughout his report. This report was then sent over to Project Blue Book, the U.S. Air Force's UFO research project. Within a few days, Betty visited the local library and checked out a book written by retired Marine Corps Major Donald Kehoe, who was a pioneer UFO researcher during his time in the service. At this point, he was heading the civilian group, NICAP, National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. If you listened to the pod all the way back during episode one, you might recall that Major Kehoe was one of the investigators studying the incidents in nearby Flatwoods, West Virginia, after the sighting of the Flatwoods monster. On December 26, Betty wrote a detailed letter to Major Kehoe, detailing the entire encounter and leaving nothing out this time. She also explained to him that she and Barney were considering hypnotherapy to recall the events, as it was a newly emerging and popular psychotherapy at that time. Her letter was eventually passed on to Walter Webb, a fellow NICAP member and astronomer. Ten days following the supposed alien encounter, Betty began having a series of incredibly vivid, detailed, and upsetting dreams that lasted for five consecutive nights. 
She recounts that she has never had dreams with that level of detail in her life. These dreams completely preoccupied her thoughts during the day as well. When she mentioned them to Barney, he was kind, but just kind of brushed her off, so she didn't really talk much about them again. She did, however, record the events of her dreams in a journal. In one dream, she and Barney encounter a roadblock while driving, and the car is immediately surrounded by alien creatures. She fought against losing unconsciousness while being forced by two extraterrestrials to walk through the woods, only to finally spot Barney nearby. When she called out to him, he was unresponsive, as if he was sleepwalking. These alien men were roughly five feet to five feet four inches tall, wearing blue uniforms with caps, appearing to be military in fashion. The men were almost human-looking, with dark hair and eyes, prominent noses, grayish skin, and bluish lips. In the dream, the two cadets walked Betty and Barney into the ship via a walkway protruding from the bottom. Once inside, the aliens separated the couple. Betty became upset about this and protested, and one of them explained, telepathically, that it would take too long to complete their examinations if they were performed together. Betty called this man the leader. The dream continues as the leader brings another alien man she calls the examiner to the room. The examiner is kind and pleasant, and although he does speak English, he has trouble with it like a foreigner would, and it makes him difficult to understand. The examiner explained that he was going to run a few tests to evaluate the differences in humans and the species on board the craft. He cut a small lock of Betty's hair, examined her eyes, ears, mouth, teeth, throat, and hands. After examining her legs and feet, he used a blunt metal instrument, kind of like a butter knife, to scrape some skin cells onto something that looked akin to a glass slide for microscopy. Betty became understandably nervous when he pulled out a large needle that she estimated at six inches or so in length. He explained that it was for a pregnancy test, and she recalls replying through pleas not to perform the test that that is not how it's done on Earth. He pushed the needle into her belly button with great pain. While she was crying, the leader steps over waves his hand in front of her eyes, and the pain was instantly gone. With this, the examiner was finished and left the room, and she struck up conversation with the leader. He showed her a book with many strange symbols that he said she could take with her, as well as a star map to show where he came from. She admitted to the leader that she had little knowledge of the universe, and he joked with her that if she didn't know where she was, there was little sense in explaining where he had been. Funny enough, some of the beings rushed back into the room, excitedly telling Betty that they discovered that Barney's teeth could be removed. She laughed and explained to them the concept of dentures for humans, which seemed to perplex the creatures. As the men began escorting the hills from the ship, a disagreement broke out amongst them. They decided the couple should have no memory of their experiences on the ship, and she would have to leave the book behind. She insisted to them that no matter what they did to try to make her forget the sequence of events, she would one day remember what had happened. As the beings returned to the hills to their car, they encouraged them to stay and watch the ship take off before resuming their drive. It is at this point that Betty awakened and fixated on this dream experience for days. The following month, in October, Walter Webb, who had been referred to the hills by Major Donald Kehoe, sits down for a six-hour interview with the Hills. Barney asserts that they almost certainly have a mental block, preventing them from recalling all of the details. Barney did manage to convey all he could about the location, the spacecraft, and the men he saw through the binoculars. Webb determined that it was his opinion the Hills were telling him the truth about the experience, and that it did take place exactly as they said with possible exception of some variables that humans could typically and easily get mistaken, such as the amount of time they'd lost, sizes and distances of objects, etc. A few months later, in March 1963, the Hills began to open up about their experience, first by telling a group of people at their church. 
This admission felt like the weight of a big secret had been removed from the pair and opened the door for future, more public discussions of the event. In January 1964, about two and a half years after the alien encounter took place, Betty and Barney began hypnotherapy with Dr. Benjamin Simon, a well-known hypnotist from Boston. They'd been cautioned by their clergy not to take chances with an inexperienced hypnotherapist, so they'd taken the time to make sure they found someone well-qualified to work with. Early upon meeting them, Dr. Simon determined that despite Barney's pragmatic and cool exterior, the UFO encounter was causing him far more anxiety than he liked to admit. Simon also dismissed the extraterrestrial encounter theory as absolute nonsense. But he did feel that the Hills did genuinely believe that that's what happened to them, that it was a UFO encounter. Dr. Simon hypnotized both Barney and Betty separately several times over the course of the next six months. At the end of every session, he reinstated amnesia to prevent the emergence of traumatic memories to their conscious state until it was something they were ready to cope with. Simon hypnotized Barney first. Finding that his recall of seeing the not quite human men was terrifying to him. Barney expressed that he'd kept his eyes closed for most of the alien encounter out of fear. While under hypnosis, Barney recalled that the binocular strap had been torn while he was running back to the car to escape the UFO. As he drove away, he recalls he felt irresistibly compelled to drive into the woods down a small dirt path. After a while, the car stalled, and three of the alien men emerged from the tree line. They asked him not to be afraid, but that was understandably a difficult thing to ask of him in that moment. To help alleviate his anxiety, the leader instructed him to close his eyes. Barney later recounts, quote, All I see are these eyes. I'm not even afraid that they're not connected to a body, they're just there. They're just up close to me, pressing against my eyes. Unquote. Just like in Betty's dreams, he recalls them being separated as they were taken aboard the spacecraft. Barney was placed upon a small exam table, although his recall of the exam is pretty fragmented. A cup was placed over his genitalia, and he feels like a sperm sample was taken, although he doesn't recall a moment where that could have happened, so to speak. A tube was inserted into his anus briefly, then removed. Like Betty, he recalls them taking skin scrapings and examining his eyes and mouth. He recalls fingers on his spine, counting his vertebrae. Barney and Betty both recount the beings communicating telepathically with them in broken English. But when the beings communicated with each other, it was in a mumbling language they had not heard before. Barney's next memory was being escorted off the ship and watching the craft depart while in a daze. He recalls seeing the aforementioned fiery orb on the road and says, Oh no, not again. Upon discussion later, they wonder if it was the moon they saw, which was impossible because it had set hours prior. During Betty's hypnosis sessions, her recollection largely matched what she had dreamt, Although some details differed, such as the order of the sequence of events, some of the craft technology, and the appearances of the alien men. Unlike her dream recollection, Betty became very upset when recalling her capture and examination. At Simon's encouragement, after hypnosis had ended, Betty drew out the star map the leader had shown her on board. She explains that it was visually similar to a hologram and that it had more stars than she could recall but she drew out the 15 that she could remember best. There are solid and dotted lines connecting many stars, the solid lines representing trade routes, and the dotted lines as paths to less-traveled stars. After the hypnosis sessions had completed, Dr. Simon theorized that Barney's recollection of events had been inspired by the dreams that Betty recounted to him, although Barney disagreed with that theory because there were key differences between the two. The hypnosis helped Barney to accept that they had indeed been abducted by aliens, although he didn't fully invest into the abductee role as passionately as Betty later did. 
As far as Simon was concerned, the hypnosis was a success, absolving the hills of their lingering abduction anxiety. But he did later write an article for the publication called Psychiatric Opinion, in which he called the case, quote, a singular psychological aberration, unquote. A few years later, in 1968, amateur astronomer Marjorie Fish examined the star map and believed it to be the double star system of Zeta Reticuli, about 39 light years from Earth. This theory is tossed around and examined over the years, until finally famed astrophysicist Carl Sagan declared that the supposed star map was little more than a random assortment of choice points, and without the lines drawn, bore little resemblance to Zeta Reticuli. Eventually, Marjorie Fish herself rejected her hypothesis in a public statement. Jim McDonald, a resident of the area the supposed abduction took place, said it's clear to him that the hills confused an aircraft warning beacon on nearby Cannon Mountain for a UFO. He notes that on the route the hills drove that night, the signal disappears and reappears at the time they stated the mysterious lights to do so. He theorizes that the couple's exhaustion, combined with those lights, and false memories recovered through hypnosis led to an imagined encounter with extraterrestrials. Sadly, Barney passed away at the early age of 46 after a cerebral hemorrhage. After this, Betty fully threw herself into the world of alien encounters, going on UFO vigils sometimes three times a week, guest speaking at paranormal conferences, and thoroughly recording her many quote-unquote experiences to follow. At the National UFO Conference in New York in 1980, she was noted to ramble, going double over her time slot aloud, and then began to show many blurry photos of lights that she claimed to be UFOs. The initially kind audience actually jeered her off the stage at this conference, and the UFO community felt that she had lost all credibility. This was further solidified when she later self-published a book called A Common Sense Guide to UFOs, which featured outlandish stories such as seeing a truck levitating over a freeway and entire squadrons of UFOs. UFO enthusiast John Oswald joined her on one of her UFO vigils to note, quote, Mrs. Hill was unable to distinguish between a landed UFO and a street light. Unquote. Some state that the couple were clearly influenced by popular TV show The Outer Limits, as the alien creatures look very similar to what the hills describe. When Barney first drew a sketch of the alien men with a look distinctive to that particular TV show, the television program had premiered not quite two weeks prior. Remember Betty's dress that had been torn and had a mysterious pink powder on it? That dress has been lab tested at least five times over the years and was found to have organic compounds from Earth, primarily soil, bacteria, and mildew. This was an absolutely logical conclusion, but it didn't help Betty's case in convincing others that she'd experienced what she maintained over the years. Betty died of cancer in 2002 at the age of 85, having never remarried. A collection remains at the University of New Hampshire, her alma mater, containing most of her tapes, notes, and any other evidence she collected over the years of supposed extraterrestrial encounters. A historical marker has been placed at the declared site, memorializing the event. The alien abduction of Betty and Barney Hill remains the definitive extraterrestrial story of the United States and Appalachia. Well, y'all, that was the story of Betty and Barney Hill. Now let's talk about it. Okay, my first thought is, they stopped to check out the lights and to walk the dog. That dog is never mentioned again in all of this. Where did the dog go? Did the dog politely wait in the car while they were getting abducted by aliens? Because there's no mention of poor little Delcy in this whole thing after they initially stopped to check out the lights. Where did Delcy go? Why did the aliens not want to do any testing on the dog? Or did they? 
and the couple just can't recall it. And because you can't hypnotize a dog and get it to tell you about the experience, you just don't know. It is strange to me that if the dream took place the way Betty remembers her dream, it's strange that she wasn't scared. And then it's especially strange that she was afraid under hypnosis, but not afraid in the dream. But it is a dream. There is a key discrepancy, if you noticed, about Betty conveying her dreams to Barney. She said she tried to tell him about it. He brushed her off, so she never brought it up again. But he knows the details of the dreams well enough that the hypnotherapist thought that's why he remembered these experiences. And when the hypnotherapist explained to Barney, I think your memories are because of Betty's dreams, Barney explained, no, that's not why I had these experiences, because they are different. But did she tell him about the dreams or not? Because on one hand, she says she tried to tell him and never brought it up again. And on the other, he knows all of the details enough that he says, no, those weren't her dreams because they're different in these ways. That's a clear discrepancy. There's also a bit of discrepancy in my sources over the shape of the spacecraft. For the most part, it is mentioned as being disc-shaped and rotating. But in some sources, it's noted to be a cigar-shaped craft. So could it just be because if you look at something disc-shaped from the side, and if it's kind of thick, like a thick pancake, like they said, I guess that could look like a cigar, right? If you're only seeing it from that one angle. So I'm not sure if it's that or if there are just two versions of the story. I'd be curious to hear Betty's sister's account of seeing a UFO once, considering that's the reason Betty assumed that that might be what she's seeing. I couldn't find any sources telling Betty's sister's UFO story, though. And to be honest, the details of things the aliens said, like, stay there and watch, or why don't you stay and watch the ship take off? It doesn't fit to me. It doesn't seem entirely plausible, and if it does, it almost feels like we're three years old. Someone is saying, hey, stay there and watch this cool spaceship take off like we're toddlers. (laughs) And I mean, if aliens much more intelligent than us are here, I imagine that we would be like toddlers to them. So maybe that's entirely sensible. I don't know. So do I think this is a legit alien abduction story? I'm absolutely torn on that. You know, the compass over the circles on the car, the watch is stopped. That's great objective evidence if it was corroborated by anyone. No sources back up if any of those things were professionally examined. You know, they checked out the dress thoroughly, repeatedly. But what about those circles on the car that mess up the compass? Because if that was validated by someone, I would absolutely believe this happened. But for some reason, if it was ever investigated, it was never mentioned again. And then it doesn't help that Betty did not do herself any favors with credibility here. You know, it doesn't mean that this wasn't a credible story. Because she could have just kind of went off the deep end a little bit with her belief later on. And I mean, granted... If she had a legitimate alien encounter, what's that saying? If you're a nail, everything looks like a hammer. I imagine that's exactly how that would be. If I got abducted by aliens, I'm sure I would see every street light and think, oh my God, it's another one. And in general, alien stories are the hardest for me to pass fail on credibility and believability. I feel like they are almost always 50-50 with me. I think I do lean toward the side of this actually having happened. But again, there's just no evidence. None. As always, I want to know what you think. Do you believe the Hill story? Do you think they were abducted by aliens? Drop in on the Obscure Appalachia Facebook page or Instagram to tell me your thoughts. Here you can find pictures for today's episode. You can find me at ObscureAppalachia.com. I always forget to mention this. But sources for every episode, along with any relevant content warnings, are listed in the show notes if those are needed. If you love this podcast, please leave a review on your podcast provider to help others find me. For everyone who's already reviewed the show, you're the absolute best. 
Thank you to all of my loyal listeners who really launched this podcast over the past three months. I could not have done it without every one of you. I have big plans for Obscure Appalachia for 2023, so subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss those announcements because they're coming soon. I wish you all a joyous holiday season. Stay tuned after the ending music today to hear about The Innance Forgettance, a fictional audio novel in podcast form featuring an alternate Appalachia. Thanks, y'all. Until next time. The Innis Forgettance is a folk fantasy podcast set in an alternate Appalachia and far away Celtic fort. You can help support me and this story by sharing it with your friends, posting on social media, or by clicking the link in the description to buy me a coffee. I'm glad you joined me this week, and stay safe out there in the woods. There, you must be new in town. Inniscombe's a tiny mountain village. Won't take you long to find your way around. Come on down to the corn shuckin' later on. Someone's sure to let you hitch a ride in their wagon. But you better steer clear of Porter Hollis and the woods, especially the woods. According to rumor, Seventeen-year-old Porter Hollis is to blame for his mama's crying sickness. You see, he's been bewitched by the never-seen. Spirits haunting the forest who possess townsfolk's bodies and steal their souls. No one knows how or why the never-seen afflict this town. And don't you ask, don't you dare ask. Folk get all up in arms when someone starts sniffing around, asking about the past. Anyway, where was I? Oh, hope you'll stay a while. You might be new, but folk will warm up to you soon enough. It's getting dark now. Find some place to stay the night before the never seen float down from the mountains looking for a soul like you. Written and narrated by me, Leah Noel, with special appearance by David Walker, The Innis Forgettance is a fiction podcast that straddles timelines set in an alternate Appalachia and faraway Celtic fort. Travel with Porter Hollis as he sets on a journey to untangle the lies of the past and a spell woven of darkness and fear. Will he bring about Innis Combe's deliverance? or its end.